Hey. <laughs> Hello. I'm not sure you can see us, Meredith, but we can see you. Oh, I can't see you yet. <laughs> can you put us on for Meredith? Okay, yeah, actually. Hey. Oh. Hey. I'm enormous. <laughs> okay. So this, I, this is a yeah, first. Yeah. Great. Um, so th I want to say thank you all for your papers. We're going to open up pretty quickly to <laughs> audience questions. Can you hear that? Okay. This, w this is an experiment, but we will try it anyway. So. No, actually, sorry, I still can't see you. You're just a big smiley face, but that's okay. how I think of you, so that's fine. We can leave it like that. Okay, but as long as you can hear, and we'll relay the hear. question again. I may repeat the question for so Mer Meredith's understanding. Okay. That's fine. Now that we've got Meredith all the way here, you've got to ask. Okay, we have one here in the middle and one at the side. So first one. Oh, Meredith, I've heard the story of the two soldiers who end up in the uh, Academy Royal as uh, um, studio models. Can you elaborate on that? Is there any? Um, uh, surviving drawings or accounts of their life going from, oh, <laughs> Okay, that may have to be held and we'll, hold on a minute. It's, that's gonna dominate our lives, that annoying jingle. <laughs> Maybe we should um, maybe we should take a second question in the interim. Has anyone got a mic? Hold on. Just sort of a, a quick question in the meantime um, for David Maskell. I was um, um, really really interested in in your paper and what you said about the carpet he um, the ambassador the Turkish ambassador was standing on, which was of course a Turkish carpet. Um, which was, of course, a great status symbol at the time in France. And um, that was particularly interesting because, as you've shown, the line drawing, you, you showed that the Savonry carpets were laid out in the Hall of Mirrors, which, was of, which were, of course, made in emulation of those made in Turkey and were called in France a tapis à la Turque. Now, I wondered whether um, there were any comments on that in contemporary reports about um, the carpets that were laid out but also if you knew anything about the gifts that were exchanged and whether textiles were part of the gifts that, that the Turkish ambassador of the King of France exchanged at the time. Uh, yes, the <clears throat> during the six months that the ambassador was in Paris, he was taken to all the royal manufactories, including Savonet, and he expressed a great desire to have an example which was given to him as part of the diplomatic gifts that he took back to the Sultan. Yes. Do we have any chance? No, we're going to... Okay. Let's roll some other uh, questions for our speakers with us. Um, yeah. Here, um, on the front, right, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you. Um, David, it's just a question for you. It would take a, a lot of time to create a two metre high painting um, of such richness and detail. Um, this is a sort of speculative question, but who do you think commissioned it? Do you think it was kind of one of those, I'm going to do it and hope somebody buys it, or do you think there was a conversation that took place? Because it's a lot of effort to put in. Yeah, I, um, Georges Wildenstein, who, who wrote the, the catalogue resume in the 1920s, Surmise that the painting must have begun, must have been begun by the painter within you know a week or so of his arrival in Paris to finish such a large painting to be exhibited a matter of weeks after his departure. So that indicates to me, at least, that it's probably um, it, it's probably a commission. Um, and all the literature says, you know. It can't have been commissioned by the ambassador because he didn't have the money to pay for it. Well, I don't think that's true. Um, you know, it's 
it's one of the, I mean, so far I haven't found good, any documentary evidence, but, I mean, I mean, I don't read Ottoman Turkish. <laughs> uh, I got a friend who does to translate that document. But I'm on the, I'm on the trail of any documents that are held in Istanbul um, that record, you know, his impressions of his time in Paris. Because, you know, I mean, at the moment, all we have is the French side of the sources. Thank you. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Okay. And many of the ambassadors uh, got their portraits painted, um, some of them uh, to take home with them other state in Paris, but they're really, for our exhibition, we have come across quite a few spectacular portraits. Maybe this is one of the, the, the very best, <laughs> but uh, there are, it, it was not unusual for those foreign visitors to have themselves portrayed while in France. So we'll go to the back, and then we'll come back to, well, Thank you both very much for your really interesting papers. Um, I have a question for Danielle. I, I know you said that Hopp was not married when he had the house built in Amsterdam, and I'm sorry, I, maybe I missed it if you said that he was then subsequently married as ambassador when he went to Versailles. Um, d was he married, and if so, did his wife play any role at all in the, sort of the diplomacy? Or if not, in your research for the exhibition, have you uncovered any details of sort of you know, diplomatic um, sort of circle and, and the other roles played by the people who assisted the diplomats. Well, maybe I did make myself clear. The house that I showed you in Amsterdam was built by his father. Oh, so yeah, it's I'm the sorry, house I'm where sorry. he grew up. Um, and he was not married when he went to France. He remained unmarried while in France. He only married, uh, well, when he's back in the Netherlands. So he was rather late. He was in his early 40s. The person whom you're trying to reach is current. Sorry about that. Um, Carry on regardless. The diplomatic dispatches, copious as they are, they do not tell us very much about the private lives uh, of the diplomats. And you really have to read between the lines, like the time that he actually wrote about his misfortune that his own cousin died, who lived with him. And one of the, his pages actually also died um, of the same smallpox uh, outbreak. But there is very little, you know, it's tantalizing at times. Here he goes to Versailles and all he says, the fountains didn't work as well as those at Marly. <laughs> Tell us a bit more, really, yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> and then he, he gives us all these details about illnesses and uh, protocol, every up nauseum, really. Um, and you just wish that they would uh, write a bit more as a, as a tourist. And there is very, very little. Occasionally <laughs> you, you find references to the diplomats in the, in the diaries of the French courtier. That you will, but again, it's usually very factual and not um, not giving us any uh, wonderful details. So. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. And actually, sorry, can I also ask David the same the same thing for the Ottoman Empire, sort of diplomatic envoys? Um, he was married, but of course, um, his wife did not accompany him. Uh, his son did, and his son-in-law were part of his retinue. And of course he was somewhat horrified, I think, at the public lives that French women were allowed to live uh, compared to the Ottoman Empire. I think at the public lives that women were allowed to live. Oh, we've got a we've got a five second delay, which is going to cause us a few technical issues. Hello again, Meredith. It's great to see you. I don't know how long this one will last, but um, if you have a question for Meredith, you might want to ask it right now, and then we'll see. Yeah, there was a question. Oh, oh yes, um, there was a question for you about you mentioned um, uh, uh, enslaved. Uh, former soldiers who were, who were brought to the model, to be models at the academy. Do, and we had a question that, that you got cut off uh, as you listened to about, do we know much more about them or have we have, do, we have any, do we have any drawings or any physical proof 
of that being the case? No, not, it's only listed in the records of the Academy, and so far I would love to find something. Um, they were there in 1688, which was a pretty interesting year, considering what Lafon was working on at that moment. Um, the fountain for the Louvre courtyard that I mentioned, also the Royal Louis um, and other projects. Um, and, but it, it doesn't, the reports don't specify why they were specifically sent there or um, who or, you know, why they were modeling. So no, if anyone finds anything, I would, I would love to know, but so far I haven't found anything more than that. Thank you. That's great. We can hear you really well. That's great. Um, and I think, I mean, I don't know how many others of you were surprised by the numbers uh, involved in the, what Meredith was telling us about the amount of slaves, the amount of galleys. I mean, these are, as you said, Meredith, these are, these are fairly um, arresting facts um, about the... Can I ask, how, when, what happened after Louis XIV? What, what was the, uh, what was the, con is there, what's the continuing story after this? It, I mean, it's not really your subject, but I, I was interested to know, you know, this is a big slavery culture to have instituted. What, what then happened? After the death of Louis XIV? Yeah. yeah. Louis XIV? Yeah. Well, it actually, it does um, come into play in our book because we're going to have a whole kind of concluding chapter about the aftermath. And the galley corps that he and Colbert started actually survived until 1748. Um, and the crown is continuing to buy Esclave Turk in this period. And a lot of the naval officers are really asking for it. And they say quite specifically that it improves officer morale, which is kind of a horrifying thing to, to hear. But um, there was, I think in this period, um, galleys were even less operational. Um, they'd become even more kind of technologically outmoded, but they paired with great political salsa. Um, not only for crusading period or for, for um, you know antiquity, but I think also for the Grand for the for the reign of Louis the Fourteenth. That there were a number of different fests that they were featured in. Um, so I think in prints that they were by Jacques Rigaud, who did a whole series of prints. Um, one for the Maurepas, who Daniela mentioned, um, the Navy minister at the time. And then the other aspect in which we're kind of think about them after the death of Louis the is during the plague of Marseille um, in 1720 when Esquire Turk and other galley slaves were conscripted to remove the bodies of plague victims from the streets of Marseille. And, and they were promised freedom if they did. Of course, the vast majority of them then contracted the plague and died. But they're represented in some really amazing paintings by Michel Serre, um, which were publicly displayed in Paris and then by other, make, other artists um, and, and other engravings. And it's one of the ways in which the body of these enslaved Turks really, and also other galley slaves, really persist in representation. So we're kind of thinking about how their, their, their representation shifts in this period and means. It's about a kind of decline of royal power, about a kind of fear of globalization and its consequences, the plague, can be related to the John Law scandal and other things happening at the time. You know, what, what does it mean? That's something that we're, we're thinking about. Thank you. So, a uh, question from... Thank you. I have a question for David. Uh, regarding that painting, uh, isn't it true that uh, human images are not allowed in Islam, were not allowed in Islam? So, perhaps the ambassador could not take the painting back with him. Uh, yes, I, I agree with you. But he... he was clearly happy to sit for artists. Perhaps he wanted to leave a, a very nice, uh, uh, basically, souvenir for, uh, 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 for Paris, uh, for a place that he really liked, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that could well be the case. It's, so it's possible. Were there any cases where um, slaves were basically given freedom during the reign of Louis XIV and Louis XV? So were there any cases of uh, successful granting of freedom to slaves 
during um, uh, sort of in, in, in on mass or individually, I suppose, between in the reigns of four, uh, Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Fifteenth. Successful release of slaves. Yeah, yeah, and or granting of. Do you mean the sort of returning of them to North Africa or rans ransoming or setting them free? It's more about um, whether there were any slaves that were integrated in the French society that were given freedom, like sort of. Mark, can you repeat it? It's hard for Sorry, me to yes. Hear it's actually more a question about liberated slaves living as freed people in the society of, of the Paris or the Versailles, indeed, of, uh, the, of, the, of uh, Louis XIV or XV. Well, I think, um, you know, there is this, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, there was this legal tradition um, that Sue Peabody has written a book about this called There Are No Slaves in France, that actually any slave, and this was from, you know, the early modern period, earlier than the 17th century, that slaves should go free if they set foot on French soil. You could have uh, slavery in the colonies, but once you were actually on metropolitan soil, you were supposed to free slaves. And so there are many instances of that happening, and Peabody's book talks also about slaves who themselves tried to exert some agency and go to the courts and, and claim release. And there are some instances of captured, you know, a squad Turk, Ali slaves, trying to do that too, but the 14th was actually very, very reluctant to release, to liberate these captives, even when he agreed to do so in various treaties. That's one of the reasons why he was at war with Algiers for most of the 1680s. There was a belief that a squad Turk was best um, they were also good shipbuilders, they performed other kinds of tasks, and so, um, I mean, y there are a few cases of that happening, and of course it's not only these North African slaves from France at this moment, but also slaves in the Atlantic War, that the, the, the better known um, slave trade that's happening at that moment. And, and yes, there are cases in which they are ransomed, or they are, are liberated, but in the case of these galley slaves, the king tried very, very hard to hold on to them. Thank you. Paul. Um, thank you. I've got a question for Daniela regarding the depiction that you show, the painting that's coming to uh, New York showing Cornelius Hopp being um, received by Louis XV. And I thought it was very interesting because it sort of shows the contrast between the Louvre and Versailles. You know, we've seen the depictions of the Hall of Mirrors and the grand receptions. And this is a quite, a, um, quite a gloomy room that's shown there, the, the, the cabinet. And I wonder uh, whether Hopp um, described this scene uh, in detail and whether you think it's an accurate depiction, in particular, whether he says anything about the throne chair, because obviously... Louis XV is, well, there, I think, well, eight or nine years old. So, and, and in the famous Rigaud portrait, he has, as a five-year-old, a, a throne chair that um, fits him. And, uh, and we saw in the other depiction that the king actually sits on the throne rather than stands in front of it. Uh, does he say anything about that? Uh, Hope, as I said, is unfortunately very elaborate in terms of protocol, not very elaborate in terms of describing environments. He does mention that um, it took place in the apartment of the former queen, the late queen, and it was only because the king was temporarily staying at the Louvre rather than at the Tuileries because the Tuileries were being, was being cleaned. Um, he doesn't mention very much, um, and certainly not, he does say that the king is standing, that his head is bare, he mentions exactly who all the people are surrounding him, but that's, that's about it. And uh, indeed, the, the painting doesn't look at its best. It is going to be um, restored and uh, cleaned for our <laughs> exhibition. So I hope you will see it in a little bit less gloomy state um, once the exhibition is on. But unfortunately, he really doesn't say very much. But one of the things, for instance, and it is the pettiness of this protocol is unbelievable. So he arrives at the Louvre, and there he sees the, the Sans Suisse. The, um, and they have, uh, as gala for, uh, uniform, these very 16th century inspired uniforms, very much like the, as the Swiss guards at the Vatican today. Um, but when he arrives, there, is the, there are the Swiss guards without their uniforms. So he even stops the whole um, unfolding of the, of the event to <coughs> inquire, what is the matter here? And then he gets word to say, oh, well, since the, the, the Louis XIV died, 
the, the Saint Suisse haven't been given new uniforms, so they didn't have it. Then there were no banners, and he's asking, why are there no banners? And they say, oh, well, but they are at the Tuileries, and now we're at the Louvre. And he just then makes sure to register a complaint with the introducteur des ambassadeurs that this is not how it is according to the book. I mean, this is what you get into, you know, incredible detail. Unfortunately, descriptions about the palace, uh-uh, pas du tout. That's uh, well, very, very sad, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that should give us our hint as to what it is that they really cared about. I mean, and, you know, gout, smallpox, and protocol, I think, I mean, you know, maybe that should be telling us what we should be looking at, you know. I mean, I don't know, you know. Exactly. Anyway, I, alas, I, and I want to especially thank Meredith for all your patience as we brought you in and out, Meredith. Thank you very much for being with us. And, uh, and, and, and I'd like to also thank... Daniel and David for excellent papers and for responding to questions. We must wrap up now, so thank you very much, all of you, and thanks for your paper, Mary.